Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. Today's episode is sponsored by the town of Millet. Throughout this episode, I'm going to be looking at various things in the community of Millet, its history, and some of the things you can check out. I'll also be talking to Tracy from the Millet Museum about the history. Now this won't be like a regular episode where I go through the chronological history of a community. Instead, I'll be highlighting various aspects of it. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. Indigenous History Prior to the arrival of Europeans, the land around Millet was occupied mostly by the Cree people who moved through the area following the bison. The movement of the indigenous would have a very big impact on Millet, and likely contributed to its founding. The paths the indigenous took through the region would be used by fur traders and explorers, which led to the establishment of Fort Edmonton. From there, the trails eventually grew in use, and when it came time for the railroad to go through, the path the indigenous took for centuries would be the path of the railroad. From there, Millet would be born as a new community. Today, Millet sits on Treaty 6 land. The Founding of Millet Millet is unique in terms of communities in Alberta because the origin of its name comes from several different sources. One source says that the name comes from Jean-Francois Millet, who was a French painter and a favourite painter of William Cornelius Van Horn, who was a railway owner that named Hobima, nearby to Millet, after Mein Dirt Hobima, a Dutch painter. The other origin of the name, and much more likely according to local historians, is that the name comes from August Millet. Now I'm going to be pronouncing his name Millet, because he was a French fur trader and that's likely how it was pronounced. He was a fur trader who often moved through the area, and sometimes Millet would work for the Hudson's Bay Company, and other times he was under the employ of the Northwest Mounted Police at their outpost at Fort Saskatchewan. He was often a travel companion and guide for Father Lacombe, one of the most celebrated figures from the early history of Alberta, and for whom Lacombe, Alberta was named. This is where we get back to William Van Horn. He asked Father Lacombe to name stations along the Edmonton-Calgary railway line, and he would suggest several names, including Ledoux, which is now pronounced Leduc, in honour of a fellow missionary, and Millet, or Millet, for the travel companion who joined him on so many journeys. August Millet would eventually die tragically while trying to cross the Red Deer River. It's not known where Millet is buried, but the community that shares his name has a memorial to him. Here's Tracy from the Millet Museum. Father Lacombe decided to name this station Millet after his longtime traveling companion, and his name was August Millet. August Millet was a fur trader who sold furs to some of the earliest known residents of what is now the Millet area. And Millet was a canoeman for Father Lacombe on his very long river trips. In 1883, the CN Railway would reach Calgary and the road up to Edmonton was a cart trail that was getting busier. Stagecoaches carrying passengers, mail and freight would go up the road, roughly 300 kilometers, taking five days. Each night, the stagecoach would stop at a stopping place. In Millet, the most common stopping place was that of Frank Lucas and his family. In 1890, the Calgary Edmonton Railway Company would be formed, and 6,400 acres of land would be granted for the railway to build on. In August of 1891, the railroad reached Strathcona, just south of Edmonton. The first person to live in the Millet area was Ben Slaughter, who was also friends with the aforementioned August Millet. He had a store and living quarters on the east side of the railroad, and served as the first postmaster for the area. That store was an important place to stay in those early years. T. H. Howes recounted in 1978 that, when we arrived with a car of settlers' effects on April 7, 1900, Mr. and Mrs. Henry Wright and their daughter were living in rooms over the store of Ben Slaughter. They were kind enough to let us stay in the store part of that first night. Within a few years, more people began to live nearby, and in 1901 several buildings were in what would one day be Millet. A store would be built by B.A. Van Meter in 1902, followed by a hotel that same year. On June 17, 1903, the village of Millet was established with James Blades becoming the first overseer of the community, and the community 
was ready to grow. The Nebraska Club Many of the early settlers to the millet area came from the United States, looking for cheap and plentiful land. Many were far from home and knew very few people. For the women, who were often at home for weeks on end, it could be a very lonely existence. Many of the families in the area had come from Nebraska, and they would meet at each other's homes on a regular basis, singing songs and playing games. Homemade ice cream was often served during the potluck suppers, and eventually the group of families started to call themselves the Nebraska Club. The 1927 Town Fire Fire was an ever-present danger in many rural communities in Alberta, and before modern firefighting techniques, a single fire could destroy an entire community. In October of that year, a fire broke out in Vic's garage around 2.30pm when a gasoline engine that was being repaired burst into flames and quickly burned down the entire building. In a terrible stroke of bad luck, the chemical apparatus that was the firefighting equipment of the town was in the garage when it burned down. It could not be reached due to the flames and heat, and a bucket brigade was started, but there was not enough water to deal with the raging fire. Help was summoned from Wetaskiwin and Leduc, and threshing gangs came in from the fields to assist in dealing with the fire. In the end, the damage would be $50,000, or $750,000 in today's funds, and it would destroy most of the downtown area. Mayor A.P. Mitchell would lose an entire business block and lose most of his household effects and clothing. Also lost in the fire were Graham's Pharmacy, F. Day's Legal Office, and Dr. Ward's Dental Office. Notable Residents When I talk about the history of a community, one thing I really enjoy doing is looking at the history of the community through the people who came from it and reached the world stage. These people shed light on their community, and in some cases, bring people to the community itself. With Bob Robinson, Millet has one of the greatest rodeo competitors ever. Robinson was born on September 13, 1931, and his father was Sykes Robinson, who won the World Champion Steer Riding Competition at Madison Square Garden in 1927, and was the Canadian Saddle Bronc Riding Champion at the Calgary Stampede in 1939. As for Bob, he would get his professional rodeo win in 1953 as the all-round champion in Edmonton. This would begin an incredible streak of excellence that few have equaled in the rodeo world. From 1955 to 1964, he was one of the top 20 bull riders and saddle bronc riders in the RCA. During that time, he was the 1954 saddle bronc champion in the Alberta Central Circuit, the 1956 Canadian champion saddle bronc rider, the 1956 all-around Canadian champion Edmonton, and the saddle bronc champion at the Calgary Stampede. In 1962, he would become the first Canadian to win a major event in the NFR in the United States. Robinson would be inducted into the Canadian Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame, and in 1997 was awarded the Pioneer Rodeo Award at the Calgary Stampede in 2009, and he was inducted into the Rodeo Hall of Fame in Oklahoma in 2014. He is also ranked as the ninth greatest bull rider in Canadian history by Everything Cowboy. Another notable resident was Winifred Thompson Ross, who would find herself a war widow in 1918 in Millet, and quickly began to farm the land herself. She would then join the Millet chapter of the Farm Women's Union of Alberta, and she would become interested in improving the standards of rural schooling and promoting adult education. For the next 24 years, she would serve as the provincial leader of the organization, and was on the original committees for the National Farm Forums, the Canadian Research Committee on Practical Education, and the Advisory Committee to the Schools of Agriculture. In 1948, she was appointed to the Board of Governors of the University of Alberta and served as the Vice President of the Alberta Council on Child and Welfare, and she would pass away in 1974. The Millet and District Museum the lifeblood of the history of a community is found in its local museum. On February 25, 1977, the Millet and District Historical Society was formed, and less than a decade later, in 1985, the Millet and District Museum would be built, and the exhibit room was opened. The facility has 12,800 artifacts from Millet and the 13 surrounding school districts dating back to the first half of the 20th century. 
In addition, there are several rooms that depict the history of the area, including the Hillside School, John Barth's Barbershop, and Kenny Keir's Implement Office, along with the home setting of a bedroom, living room, and kitchen that represents the period of 1900 to 1950. There is also the veterans' wall in the upper floor of the museum, which features the portraits of the millet and district veterans of the First and Second World Wars. The exhibit, from a signpost in a slough, the history of millet is depicted from 1900 to 1960, depicting everything from the railroad arriving to the building of several important landmarks in the community. Here's Tracy from the Millet Museum. Uh, we have permanent exhibits, including the signpost in the slough, which is what Millet was. It was literally a slough <laughs> on our main level, featuring the beginning of Pioneer Life, as well as Joe Moonen's Veterans Wall and the ongoing Pioneer Women exhibit. In our lower level, we have our Moonen Gallery, which features an actual historic building that was brought in, which features the Hillside School, a kitchen, barbershop, our Vic's garage, which presently is Leanne's, and our Kenny Kerr's office and a parlor and bedroom. So in our exhibit room, which is our main law, uh, level, we offer constantly changing experience as we cycle through temporary exhibits. And they highlight various aspects of our community, including different people, places, organizations, and events throughout Millet's history. This Format allows us to interact closely with our community and to display both past and present achievements. We are also display the multiple and varied awards won by Millet in our national and our international Communities in Bloom competition since 1996, which is my pride and joy. This exhibit is available now on our website. We just launched it and uh, we're so proud of it. Um, um, something that's totally different for us. Our theme and our, mo our, our mandate is we are ever-changing. We have our, an award-winning experience. We have won multiple awards over the years. Um, I believe we have welcoming and knowledgeable staff who are always happy to share Millet's amazing histories and stories through both our exhibits and through our archival resources. And our staff are also trained and happy to provide information and directions to our current businesses and attractions throughout Alberta. Uh, this year, we have the features of the lockdown creations of our Millet Arts and Craft Guild, um, an overview of the lockdown experience in Millet, and which there was beautiful pieces of, of quilts that have been created during that experience. And then we also highlighted our summer kids program, which was created in lieu of our on-site program. So we did, um, we sent kids home um, with a, a multitude of children every week. And our newest exhibit is, of course, virtual, which is the Everyone a Pioneer, which features the 50 Pioneer women. We also did one from Millet to the World, which recognized the contributions of more than 35 years. We're celebrating our 35 years as a museum this year, and we celebrated our 35 years of our staff that have um, contributed as well from Millet to when they went off to the world. So it features what they're doing when they did what they did with us and then what they did in the in present day. And upcoming, we are celebrating our 25 years of Millen and Bloom virtual exhibit that's going to be launched in mid-September for the International and National Communities in Bloom Symposium. So we're quite excited about that. I'd like to take a break away from the episode for a second to talk about ExploreNet. I spent most of my life living in rural areas in Canada, and I remember the days of dial-up internet and spotty high-speed service. For the past three years, I have been a customer of ExploreNet and I can honestly say that it is the best rural internet I have ever had. My job as a podcaster means I spend a lot of time researching online, interviewing people over Zoom, and uploading content. Through it all, ExploreNet has provided me with excellent service. When I'm not working, I enjoy streaming content on several streaming platforms and even doing some online gaming with a friend in Ontario. ExploreNet allows me to do all of that with ease. Right now, they offer up to 50 megabits per second on their new LTE network with unlimited data. Their service has only become faster and better since I first signed on. Today and beyond, ExploreNet is investing in building and upgrading the network at a rapid pace. ExploreNet is rural, and that is their route, and that is their focus. 
For more information about rural internet options in your area, go to explorenet.com or call 1-866-285-2253. The Millet Town Murals The history of Millet can be found not just in books at the museum, but on the walls of the buildings throughout the community. One mural is the Lions Club mural, which depicts a Lions Club celebration in the community, complete with a dance and fundraisers that highlight some of the things the organization has done for Millet. The library mural is one of the more unique murals in that it depicts scenes from books, including Charlotte's Web, while also displaying grain elevators from the early history of the community and two young individuals who are on their way to get books from the library, opening up new worlds for themselves. The Community Spirit Mural depicts a dance at the Community Hall, which brought many people out for dances, social events, fundraisers, and more. Here's Tracy from the Millet Museum. Uh, so there is uh, presently six murals in Millet that were designed by what was called by who was called the Virtual Arts Committee, and the Mu Millet Museum was part of that to assist with the research. So they're located on our library, our Community Hall our school bell kiosk and Rexall drugstore, and as well in the Millet Museum. All of the murals were painted by the late Ray Binder, with the exception of one, and that is the mural We Serve, which was painted by artist Jeannie Broad. And so the one is called Community Spirit, and that's located on the front of the community hall. The mural is located in, in the front of the building, and it displays over 100 years of the community halls in Millet. The mural shows a dance at the original Pinions Hall, a predecessor on, of the current community hall. The veterans mural is located inside the mural along the veterans command over wall. And it's actually, if right behind me in my office, I see it every day. The mural shows three millet veterans, Alder Greenslade, Raymond McCauley, and Dallas Smith. And so from the three branches of the military, infantry, Navy, and Air Force. And the mural symbolizes the remembrance of all the soldiers who fought in the war. The Lions mural is called We Serve, and it's painted on the back of the Millet Piper Library, and that's straight across from the current Lions Hall. It was commissioned in honor of the Lions Club in 2005, and this mural recognized the continuing work of the Lions member in our community. The mural located at the Rexall Drugstore depicts the Arlington Hotel, built in 1902, which stood on the site now occupied by the drugstore. The Arlington Hotel burnt down in 1995, and the museum also holds a mural reflecting life in Millet early years, and that mural portrays Alberta Street, which is now 50th Avenue, or everyone else knows it as Highway 2A that goes through Millet, and the mural is from 1930s. The School Bell Kiosk, which is located just north of the museum, also holds a mural depicting the inside of the original one-room school. So when you walk into the School Bell Kiosk, it actually is like walking into the old one-room school with a depiction of exactly what it would look like. So those are the, mur the murals that are in Millet presently. Um, there is one that was at the Millet Library and we're just working on replacing that, which was damaged during one of our storms. The Walking Tour, a great way to learn about a community's history is through its walking tour. The wonderful thing about the walking tour is that you not only learn that history, but you can experience that history directly, and often it comes at no cost. In Millet, there is an excellent walking tour that runs 3.3 kilometers in total, taking about an hour and a half and featuring 30 stops, which I will highlight some of here. The first stop on the tour is the fire wagon that actually dates back to 1938 and was used in Millet by the fire department from 1939 to 1954. As I mentioned earlier, the community had gone through a terrible fire in 1929 and ensuring that didn't happen again was of paramount importance. Prior to 1938, the community used soda acid extinguishers. In 1916, the first firefighting equipment was bought in the community which had a hand pamper, which was never used because the hose for the device had already begun to decay. The new small engine bought in 1938 held two 45-gallon tanks that contained calcium chloride to prevent the water from freezing, along with carbon dioxide to provide pressure. The wagon could be moved by a machine 
or by two or three men pulling it. This fire wagon proved its worth when it saved both Vic's garage and Moan's grocery in fires that occurred during the usage period of the wagon. The St. John's Anglican Church was built in 1929, but the land it sits on was originally purchased by the congregation in 1914. Most of the money to build the church was raised by two women named Bernice and Winifred Jocks. The church would be built by Harry Parley, a farmer near Cold Lake. Bishop H.A. Gray of Edmonton would conduct the service of the church soon after its construction, and the first wedding would be held on January 1, 1930, and was conducted by Rev. Arthur Murphy. That wedding has a strong connection to Canadian history because his wife was Emily Murphy. Emily Murphy would be a Canadian women's rights activist and an author who was the first female magistrate not only in Canada, but in the British Empire. She is also one of the famous five, who were a group of women that fought for women's rights and launched the Persons case. I talked about that case in a previous episode and its impact on Canadian history, and I encourage you to check it out. A later stop on the walking tour is that of the Millet Royal Canadian Legion. While the building itself was built in 1997 after a fire destroyed the original Legion at a different site, the site it's on has a deep history in Millet thanks to the Millet Creamery. The Millet Creamery was built in 1924 and quickly began to produce cheese and butter. The Creamery provides another historic stop on the walking tour, and it's found at the recreation of the Millet Burns Creamery Rock Garden. In 1937, the Creamery staff decided to beautify the town, and they created a rock garden just south of the Creamery building. Perennials were donated by local residents and a fountain was installed in the garden. The garden would flourish for years until many creamery staff members left to join the fight in Europe during the Second World War. In 1998, the Communities in Bloom Committee, as well as the town and volunteers, recreated the current garden. In 1907, St. Norbert's Catholic Church was built in the community on land that had been donated by P.J. Mullen two years previous. Fundraising began in 1906, with P.J. Mullen going above and beyond once again and donating $200, equivalent to $5,000 today. Several other donations came from business owners in the community, including a keg of nails from the hardware store. Lumber was donated by the Mullen Brothers Sawmill at Pigeon Lake and hauled to the community by volunteers. The church would cost $1,550 to build, or $38,000 today and it opened on December 1, 1907, when it was blessed by Bishop Emile Joseph Legal, the future Archbishop of Edmonton. A statue was donated by the Abbey of Grimbergen in Belgium, and while changes would come over the years, the building itself still stands. Schools were incredibly important to early communities, and often it did not take long for a school to be built in any new community. Two previous schools had been built in Millet over the years. One school was built in 1901, but it burned down soon after, and it was replaced in 1902 with a two-room school. In 1930, $15,000 was borrowed, or $224,000 today, to build a brand new school for the growing community. This new school would have four classrooms accommodating grades 1 to 12. A laboratory was situated in the building as well, and there was a large central hall that was used for many events. The school would change over the years with new additions in 1954, 1959, and 1965, and the school still operates to this day, but since March 23, 1981, it has been the Griffiths Scott School, in honour of Perry Griffiths, who was a principal there for 24 years, and Jean Scott, who was a teacher for 27 years. Earlier in this episode, I talked about the Great Fire of 1927 that hit Millet. That fire had started in Vic's garage, and, like I said, the garage was completely destroyed. On the site of that fire, a new building was built in 1927 for the garage, which was again damaged in 1948 by fire, but the building was not destroyed. And while Vic's garage is no longer around, the building still is, and today it is Leanne's bar and grill. As I've mentioned before, the railway was the lifeblood of any community if it wanted to survive in the 20th century. Without a railway, chances were a community would go from a boom to bust within a year. The first railroad to come through the Millet area was built by the CPR in 1891, and with that railroad came settlers and new visitors to what would one day be Alberta. The first station would be built in 1902 consisting of a 20-foot platform that replaced the boxcar building that had been the station for years. 
a new station would be built in 1907, which included a better platform, freight sheds, and living quarters. From this station, the world would come to Millet. One of the more unique stories of the station is that until the 1950s, train orders were telegraphed to the station, and the station agent would attach them to a bamboo hoop, and the engineer would grab the orders as the train went by. The longest serving agent of the station was Cephas A. Kent, who served from 1913 to 1947. Passenger service would end in the 1970s, and the station would be moved, but on the site of that station is a wonderful tree grove with a plaque detailing the history of the station that can be read on the walking tour. On the 18th stop of the walking tour, you will come to one of the oldest buildings in the community, and arguably the first church. In 1901, the Methodist Home Mission was started in Millet by Mr. Frid, who is a stonemason and would be the person to get the church built in the community. In 1902, the Millet United Church was built and opened in 1903. At the time, it was called the Millet Methodist Church, and the Methodist Church served many purposes in the community, including acting as an early school for children of the area until a new school was built. In 1948, the church was remodeled, and further changes came in the 1980s. In 2012, the building was officially sold, ending over a century of church services in the building. Community halls have always been an important part of a community's social life. The first community hall was Pinions Hall, built in 1917. Pinions Hall would host concerts, movies, and much more for several decades until 1942 when it was sold and demolished. Fred Pinion had built the hall himself by cutting logs from Pigeon Lake and transporting them to the community. A new hall would eventually be built, and it is the 21st stop on the walking tour. The Millet Community Hall that was built by the Millet Board of Trade in 1950 and 51 would hold its first event on June 27, 1951, when the building was still under construction. A total of 300 people attended that first dance, and there would be many more after that. A large legacy mural, as I mentioned, is on the front of the hall that was painted on the 100th birthday of the community. Now quite odd for a community like Millet, it would take a decade, until 1902, before a bank was built. Discussions were conducted with the Imperial Bank in Wetaskiwin, and it was decided that the hotel sample room would be used as a new bank. Now previously, this room had been used by traveling salesmen so they could show merchandise to local shopkeepers. From that year on, Millet would have a bank. In 1927, a cottage-style building was built, and it served as the location of the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce until 1985, when it moved to Wetaskiwin. The building still exists, and can be seen as the 24th stop on the walking tour. Hotels were always something that was needed in a community during its formative years, and at the present site of Rexall Drugs, the 25th stop on the walking tour, you will come across the original site of the Arlington Hotel. The original hotel was built in 1902, and it would see several additions and changes. In 1924, W. Keats of Edmonton would purchase the Arlington Hotel, and it is notable because his son was Duke Keats. Duke was a member of the NHA, WCHL, and NHL from 1915 to 1934, during which time he competed in the 1923 Stanley Cup Final with the Edmonton Eskimos, losing to the Ottawa Senators. From 1926 to 1929, he played for Boston, Detroit, and Chicago in the NHL, recording 49 points in 82 games. He would be inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1958. As for the hotel, it would sadly burn down on February 15, 1995, but a mural is now on the building at the site that shows how the hotel looked during its prime. And within that hotel you would also find the Telephone Exchange, which operated there from 1915 to 1958. Here's Tracy from the Millet Museum. Uh, the Millet Museum walking tour uh, outloads the history and locations of various historic spots in Millet, such as the Millet Mercantile, which is now our switchback, switchback Mercantile. And there's Vic's Garage, which is now our Leanne's Bar and Grill. Um, the tour was designed to give visitors the opportunity to, to learn Millet's history for themselves as they explore the town. It's offered in both English and French. The tour brochures guide visitors throughout all the history of local businesses. There's plaques, there's murals, there's a lot of gardens, and of course all of our organizations are included in there. And this gives the visitor just kind of an immersive experience of Millet's history and our 
and culture, both past and present, because as you're going through the community, you can read about what's historic and then you see actually what's there. Um, the, uh, the tour presently is being put up onto our website because uh, uh, to be able to have everyone have the ability to go through each of the spots. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Canadian History X, and if you did, please give a rating and review. You can reach me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history. Just go to canadaehx.com. And you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.